Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a so it's been a while since we've done this, Sarah. I don't, like you right. obviously, you you obviously don't keep track of when we post, but I think the last time we actually did an episode was like over a month ago. Yeah, um, wow. we were grinding. <laughs> we we've been yeah, I've been grinding. Julian's been grinding. Andy's been grinding. Joe's been grinding. Um, it's it's tough to fit these in, and it doesn't make a lot of sense unless we get a couple people on. Um, okay. and uh. And glad to have you on, Sarah. I I saw that tweet um, that you're you're now profitable, which is which is why I, I, I was like, I reached out. I was like, that's amazing. I'm like, we right. gotta talk about this. This has got to be this is this has got to be something that a lot of companies are striving for, and also a lot of a lot of people are not public with it. Um, so for one, congrats on that. That must feel amazing. Yes, it does. It it feels. Just as good as I expected it to feel. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so give everybody. So, you've been building Winnie for how long now? For seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. Been a and journey. You, and you've been on the the venture train for that entire journey, um, being unprofitable as as most venture yes. companies are until a certain point, hopefully, um, and then. What what kind of led to the movement towards profitability and, and everything like that? Yeah, we weren't even just unprofitable. We also didn't even make any money for a long time. So the first few years <laughs> of our journey, like there was there was no way for people to give us money. There was no paid product uh, and not even like we didn't even have like a, a plan for how we were going to monetize. <laughs> right. So it's really been uh, like a a full 180 from where we started uh to actually building a real business so how did that so walk, walk us through it. so what what years so i know you pivoted the business we had you on um uh before and we talked about your your pivot into now something that's working when did you start right. collecting revenue and then i uh, just i guess just recently you turned profitable yeah so gosh i mean I am going to get all the the dates wrong of when we first started collecting like our first dollar of revenue. But, you know, it was before the pandemic that we yeah. had a business where we charged, we figured out we could charge someone. Those people were the daycares and preschools. Those are our customers. Right. They were a two-sided marketplace, <laughs> but we don't monetize the transaction of purchasing childcare. We actually just monetize the daycares and preschools that are essentially paying to, you know, get better visibility on the Winnie platform and get some, you know, better features of their account. Um, so we, we started basically in 2019 having some customers, some people that paid us money, but yeah. it was very few and there was no kind of self-service way for those customers to sign up. It wasn't even right. obvious that they could sign up, um, right. that there was a way to pay for anything. Um, and it was really kind of the pandemic uh, that helped kind of us invest in the product for daycares and preschools and for them right. to really see that there was like a paid upgrade option. Got mm -hmm. it. And then um, walk us through your, uh, maybe it wasn't a decision, uh, but I'm happy to walk through w uh, what we're doing as well at, at Air House. But like, walk us through the decision of going to get profitable because typically venture companies are not looking to get profitable. Um, but I'm ass I'm assuming that it's something to do with the market raising yeah. venture capital, all of that. It's become in 2023, ex especially for the first uh, two quarters, I felt the pain of raising. Is that kind of one of the the big reasons that you want and and got profitable yes yeah, so definitely like you, you know it's a really bad environment to fundraise yeah. now and you know probably for the past year or so it's been this way uh but we wanted to be profitable i i think before that we we got really serious about getting profitable when we saw the fundraising environment change but right. we always had our eye towards profitability because we don't have a very expensive business to run. Yes. Most of our uh, costs are in our headcount. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. And not really the cost to run the business. Like we're, we're a website that 
gets a lot of traffic and a lot of that traffic is actually organic. Um, we do do some paid advertising, but a lot of that we get organically, people finding us through search. Right. Um, and so we felt like profitability is a thing we should we should strive for. It, it seemed reasonable for us. Um, but I think it wasn't until kind of recently that everyone got aligned and, and it was now suddenly not only reasonable, but desired. Um, because yeah. there's always this question you know, before at least in the before time, right, um, right. like, well, well, how could you spend more money to grow? Right, like, sure, right. you could be profitable, but shouldn't you be spending all your money and, and burning faster to grow faster? And we were always like, yeah, I guess. But now it it became like, wait, that that's not even a question we're going to ask. We are going to be aligned with getting profitable. Right. Julian, talk, talk. I know that that you you talked a lot about being on this like venture uh, train. It's like impossible to to get yeah. off. I think we've talked about some other companies that have yeah, taken so the opposite it's, it's approach. So like interesting Zapier, because I think as you're they, doing they it profitably, you're and kind now of they're, thinking they're, they're valued this is over the only five billion dollars. This is the only but, way, right? Is it, it, the way that it feels? It feels yes. like this is the only path to get there. And you're like, well, I have to keep raising every 18 months. This is just how we right. do things in this space. And you feel like this is uh, when, when I, I mean, Sarah, like, you know, you've been in the space since 2016 or 15. When you were raising in 2016, like, I remember those conversations. Kevin remembers them, I'm sure. Yep. And the dialogue was, uh, it was almost like everybody in, had realized, well, money is cheap. Let's just do this. Oh, lost you, Julian. And, and they just lost their discipline completely. And all of a sudden you were thinking, oh, of course we need to spend all the money. So I would be in board meetings and 100% yeah. people would be like, spend more, go faster, do everything faster than you can all right. the time saying, you got to spend all the money that you have within all of this time frame. That's what the, we're here for. And, uh, and those of us that grew up in that space... Yes. Now we need to reinvent the way that we thought. I definitely, you know, from a burn rate standpoint, I learned big lessons running that. And I'm wondering if you had to kind of like reverse your thinking and how difficult that was. Yeah, like a, a favorite question that, you know, always comes up with investors, whether they're existing investors or even just investors you're pitching to is like, well, if I gave you X amount, yeah. how would you spend it? Um, and I think, you know, while that might be a fun hypothetical exercise to do every once in a while, it felt like a question I was constantly thinking about and asking and like, well, how would I spend $5 right. million? How would I spend $10 million? What would I do with $25 million? Right. And I think that's just a really bad use of time as an entrepreneur, as a founder. Like, you should really not be thinking too much about that um, right. and thinking, you know, how do you grow uh, with what you have um, and the cash you have in the bank? And what we saw was like, if we could just put some of that energy of like thinking about all these hypothetical things into actually just growing our revenue and growing our business, uh, it, it, it actually produced results and was a good use of time rather than these like hypothetical exercises just right. to you know answer an investor question yeah and, and now and now that you're profitable i think this is definitely so i think that the market has forced a lot of us um that can't like what julie mentioned that kind of came we we were taught go fast um go faster and there was a reason for that of course right there was a lot of venture dollars out there if you're not going to do that your competitors are um and so that's one one reason um uh, to to go and do that but like now you don't have that like your competitors are not able to really raise the money that they were before yeah. and now you're able to hopefully if you do have like all three of us have like very low operating um uh, i'm assuming um operating costs for our businesses like i uh, for for us at airhouse we're a marketplace so really it's that the cost of of the actual headcount i'm assuming the same thing for sarah obviously we have advertising and for us we have a sales team um julian i'm assuming it's the same thing so 
once you get to profitability, it's really just like a springboard and you can kind of, especially when you don't have that competitive pressure of like everybody is raising that next huge round and it's just going to crush you. And I think it's, it's, you're even in a more unique position being a marketplace because, um, as like Sarah, as you know, like to get to liquidity in a marketplace takes so long. I don't know how many years you'd, you'd say it took you guys to get there, but it took us like, I'd say like four years to get there. So like, that's a huge head start. And then your competitors can't really raise the capital. And so you're just in a much better position to then, even if you do choose to raise more capital and maybe you choose to be up, become unprofitable at another time, you still have that base to, to go back to, to still like be profitable if you need to and pull back. But it's definitely a, a different line of thinking. Um, and also I think like a lot of, if you look on, on Twitter, like a, a lot of VCs are like, this is like, we're, we're in a, like, we're not technically in a recession, but it definitely feels like we're in a recession, especially in the tech markets. Um, and so like in recessions, like you'll hear the, the, the common, like the best companies are built out of that. And I believe that really true. I, I, I believe that constraints breed, breed creativity. Um, if you're forced to like, I'm sure that I'd, I'd love to hear your story, Sarah, on like how you got profitable, but, um, uh, for, for us as well, like we've done a couple like small layoffs and stuff like that to kind of trim the team and only spend, spend where we absolutely need to spend. But what that does is it makes you a much more healthier business to hopefully take on additional uh, capital, I think, later on. I don't know, Sarah, if you're, if you're planning to do that eventually or you just want to continue running it profitably or not. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I would never <laughs> say never to more funding. Right. Um, at, at some point, it may make sense, but we should be really calculated about, you know, what we're going to do with that funding and how it's going to grow the business to be a much bigger business at the end, not just, oh, 18 months later, you're supposed to raise more yes. funding and dilute the ownership of, of the people who have equity. Um, I right. think, you know, like uh, we, we, and we also want to be in a position where we're not forced to raise and uh, take, yeah. you know, a valuation that is lower than we think the business is worth just because of the market conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like how we got profitable, I mean, definitely like cost cutting is great. And some of these teams at companies have gotten really bloated, you know, in the 2020, 2021 era when there's lots of funding. Um, we never really got that big because we never raised one of those mega rounds of funding. Right. Um, right. Our business was never kind of one of those super sexy businesses that got a lot of funding uh, at at some point in time. Yeah. Um, and we kind of got to a point where we sort of trimmed all the costs we could trim. Like we just don't right. have that that many costs. So like, you know, we got rid of our office. Like there wasn't <laughs> anything else to get rid of. <laughs> There's nothing else to to cut back on uh, that right. would be meaningful. So then it made the the challenge really simple. We had to grow revenue. That was the only other side of the equation. Right, right. Um, and it turns out like that was a really good investment in our time and focus uh, was growing revenue and also like figuring out, you know, one one of the philosophies we, we had was like, how do we raise money from our customers? Yes. So instead of mm -hmm. building a thing and then going out and selling it and seeing if anyone would buy it, you know, we talk to our customers. We spend a lot of time with our customers and also prospective customers. And we ask, like, what are the things you need that you would spend money on? And right. like, can we sell this to you? And then, you know, we knew we had this like amazing team that is a small, amazing engineering team that can build anything. So right. we right. felt really confident, like, if they need it, we'll build it. Uh, but let's like make sure there's demand for it first and we can actually sell the thing. Yeah. Um, before we invest a ton of time and energy into building something. I, Sarah, I know that you had a gigantic amount at the time when we last spoke, there was a lot of search that was going on in your world and that organic search, of course, creates this flywheel, right? And yeah. the flywheel will build over time. I was wondering if during this phase, you were able to kind of think about creating this situation where uh, your go-to-market became different, if it became more varied, or if it just got better at that one channel that was already kind of blasting. 
So uh, I think during this time, we've really invested in our strength. That was, I think, the other big rule of thumb is like, let's not go do a million new exploratory things. Like maybe TikTok could be a big channel, but we right. don't have any presence on TikTok, nor do we have any idea how to go about making that a channel. Let's not invest in that right now. So right. we have doubled down on like what is working. Search is one of the things that is definitely working for us. Um, and so we've focused more on that um, and also narrowed our scope in terms of like what are all the things we want to do with Winnie like let's not worry about becoming the place people search for uh elder care <laughs> that right. that might be someone some VC's great idea down the road but <laughs> we are not doing that we are child care yeah. uh <laughs> let's stick to our core let's stick to what we're good at um also let's not worry about like uh how do we collect payments from parents and manage parent teacher communication like that's right. not what we do either we help right. parents find the child care yeah, right. um, and from that point on like let's have the other businesses solve those problems for now it may be something we want to yeah. do or partner with down the road but like let's really focus in on our core and it's also helped that other mm -hmm. businesses have narrowed their focus and focused on their core um, so we just don't have a lot of overlap with other businesses right now yeah. Okay. So that, that's actually out of your control is what I'm, it sounds like what I'm hearing is other businesses were doing the same thing, but in different dimensions. And you were, you not you were left with, but you chose this one single thing that was really work. The team ends up uh, really dialed into that one opportunity that you're good at and you stick really tightly mm -hmm. with that thing. Yeah. And I, I think we were lucky to choose a thing that no one else was really focused on as their main thing, which is yeah. generating yeah. demand for childcare businesses. Like our competition is Google uh, or other places you could buy ads right. that are not childcare specific. And it's really hard for childcare providers to buy ads efficiently on Google or Facebook or these other platforms. Right. Well, but, um, but that includes you, doesn't it? Like in the sense that had you, had you not built an organic... Sorry, just because I'm I'm in the search world like a fair amount, yes. thinking about it a fair amount. So especially because it's super uh, opaque to a lot of people, and because you and I have a little bit more of that depth, I'd be really like it. It doesn't. It does, it takes forever to get a get a search or you know, a search flywheel going, right? Forever, and it's really really not obvious. And there are some parallels in businesses that I think exist, and maybe you might think of as competitors or parallels. Like yeah. thumbtack, yep. And and so I was wondering, first of all, how did you come to the conclusion that it, it should be working and it should be your thing? But then once once it did have start happening, how was it clear at first? Like, how did you know to keep it going? How did you accelerate it? I know it's a big question, but it's a lot of stuff that a lot of people just don't know that much about. Yeah, I mean, the original insight for us was that childcare businesses were not really online. They didn't have much of an online presence. So there were a few big enterprises in the childcare space that did have a good presence on the internet. If you searched for daycare near me, they might come up in the search results. But that was not encompassing all the daycares that existed near you. So we realized like we could build this marketplace. And then right. once we had the marketplace of everything that was completely comprehensive with every daycare and preschool, we actually get gained an advantage in Google because marketplaces are a better result. If you're looking for yes. daycares near you, you don't want the uh, one brand. Um, you actually want to be able to f have a search platform where you can find right. the daycares you're looking for. Or if you're searching for Montessori daycare near yes. me, like it, yeah. it's actually like the the platform filtered to best Montessori searches. So. It, it's actually easier for us to rank than an individual brand and cheaper for us to rank as well, um, mm. which kind of gives us this advantage. And uh, then what we were also finding were pretty much child care providers across the board, like SEO and Internet digital marketing is not their core competency. So, you know, even the best providers are, you know, they may have really crummy websites that haven't been updated and it's really yeah. hard for them to keep up with the latest SEO practices when they're right. also keeping right. up with the latest right. 
you know, education practices, <laughs> they should be focused on the education stuff. So we were like, wouldn't it be great if we could just take this off their plate? And they were like, yeah, that would be great. We don't want right. to do this. Yeah. Just do it for us. You know, let's figure out a fair, efficient price, um, which I think we've come to with our pricing, where essentially leads they can get through Winnie are, are cheaper and more likely to convert than anywhere else that they can get leads. And so it just makes sense for them to let us kind of take care of sending them families uh, or being a major channel for sending them families. And then, sure. you know, yeah. maybe over time we can do more for them. But We'll focus and, and, on this one thing now. It also makes so much sense. Like if if you think of how much people pay on ch pay for childcare, like it's a very expensive it's, thing. It's so interesting. It's almost like you <laughs> yeah. became a purer version of yourself of, of of the of the company that you were intended to become, <laughs> and that that like what you're describing is really it's it's open table like you know what I mean. And yeah. it, it has those yeah, yeah those traditional Bill Gurley marketplace elements. And and so I'm wondering if you felt that this was the path that you always should have taken or something like that. So certainly, well, yeah, because when you hit something, you're like, oh, my God, it should have been this the whole time. I'm wondering if that happened any time along the path. So what is uh, maybe makes our business less appealing to someone like a Bill Gurley, but I think a better business in the long run? is yeah. we don't monetize the transaction like a typical marketplace. Right. Um, we actually, uh, you know, we're a lead gen based business. So as we drive our customers more leads, they pay us more money and are You're happier. more like Thumbtack, right? Yes. And those businesses have gone out of favor. Um, and I, I think a lot right. of them have actually tried to pivot to being either transaction based uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or something like it that kind of made them more more like I'm the Airbnb of childcare. Um, but actually, you know, what we found is like that model just doesn't work as well for this industry. Hmm. Um, you know, childcare is already very expensive for families. Uh, and so, you know, they don't want to pay some transaction fee on top of their childcare uh, totally. because they totally. found it through Winnie. Um, and by the same token, daycares and preschools make a ton of money off every enrollment. And the longer they leave a space open, the more money they lose. And when you're running a business that's not super high margin, you want to keep all your spaces filled at all times. So they're very incentivized yeah, right. to to pay for leads and they want control over, you know, exactly how many they need and all these factors. So we could build a business that worked really well for our industry and for our customers. Yeah. It just isn't Airbnb. And so I think um, mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, the business model looks different than Airbnb. And I think that made us fall out of favor with investors, which ultimately, you know, was the best thing for us because all these businesses that built the Airbnb for childcare, right. you know, ended yeah. up folding or are struggling and, you know, have to pivot. And we, we didn't, and we, we found the thing that made sense and, uh, you know, we didn't get Bill Gurley as an investor or whatever. But he's not invested anymore. He only, <laughs> he only does podcasts. But you're like, you're yeah. not doing it for Bill Gurley. So it's OK. <laughs> I, and actually, I, I'm going to disagree with you because I think that, you know, Open Table wasn't in the transaction, isn't in the transaction. And they are I don't able think so. to no. do <laughs> what they do without being in the transaction. And and I'm not hearing explicitly. Yeah. That so then you... it was like the whole like, yeah. oh, maybe Winnie should be like the toast or the open table yeah. where you're selling like services to daycares and preschools. Uh, and, you know, they're just paying a flat monthly fee. Um, right. And the flat fee is actually fine for like the really small centers and homes on our platform. Mm. But for the more you know, the larger businesses that have multiple locations that want to control, you know, do I receive a toddler lead or a preschool lead or an infant lead? Yeah. They want a lot of granularity and control. Um, and they also have a, you know, seasonal business. Uh, it it doesn't work as well for them to pay a flat amount. And, and we don't make as much money that way either because right, we want right. to really capitalize on the high enrollment periods. Um, so I think, you know, what we found were investors were trying to put us in different boxes and find like that one company that we were the same yeah. as in the childcare space. And when we refused to do that, 
a lot of them were like goodbye. Um, and you know, I think you don't need them. Okay, in the long run. <laughs> I kind of well, well, low-key love this story because it's the story of you winning when other people are like, I don't know, you know? <laughs> so it, it a little bit makes my day. It reminds me of something that Sam Lesson wrote on his Twitter a long time ago. Yeah. I don't know if you look at it, but he's got these. It, it, it'd be, uh, I was talking to somebody at Andrews and Horowitz last week, and they were like, I hate the information, they said. And I was like, why? It's because they're really <laughs> aggressive and all these things. But Sam Lesson's uh, wife, Jessica, started the information. It's been 10 years now. Yeah. And he writes pieces for it. And he is an investor, if you don't have the context. And he wrote about how lots of companies are in this in-between place where they can be software companies, have high margins, be effective businesses, yeah. but that there is this new lesson that is being learned from the size of software businesses at the top, the very top businesses. Okay. So like the Facebooks and the Googles and the Apples and the whatever, if you include if the tech business, whatever. And you're looking at those businesses, you're like, oh my God, these businesses are even larger than we thought that they were. And the compounding effects are even larger. So the inner, the, the downstream innovation opportunities that will create $10 billion companies by, by, as a consequence of that, become less large because they can be captured by the larger companies at the very top. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it, and the reason your story a little bit reminds me of that is because there's thousands or tens of thousands, I think, of opportunities for businesses that are not a $100 billion revenue business but that are fucking fine and that make money for the founders and they make money for the, for, for the customers and they're, and the customers really love it. And the team really likes working there. I have people like that in my circle that are founders of businesses that are just great, that are just great software businesses and that right. are not sexy, but that the founders just don't care because it's just working for them. And so yeah. freedom right. that it gives you must be really empowering is I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's, I mean, the hope. I think we're, <laughs> we're, you know, really excited about this possible path that profitability opens up where, you know, we can be free to do the things that we think make a long lasting great business without worrying as much about what investors think. But at right. the same time, we may along the way find investors like we have, I and mean, we have some incredible sure. investors right now that are really aligned with how we're doing things. And uh, if we continue to like find more of those people, then it might not be a bad idea to raise more money. Uh, but you know, totally. we won't be in a position mm -hmm. where we have to change what we want to do just yeah. to appeal to other yeah. investors. No, that makes yeah, sense. You know, but it, um, it's it's so often people. I mean, I I don't know if you remember or how much money you were raising back in the day, but it's like 2016, 2017. It really was. It would be like find ways to spend money because it was there, and it was available to be able to spend. So you were like, well, where else can we spend it? And and so it is so in retrospect, it's silly. It's a little bit the way that it feels. And now you're just like, and also, I don't know if you, if you, this resonates with you, Sarah, but like as an entrepreneur, you become a little bit like jaded about the ecosystem. And you're just like, I just want to oh, run yeah. a thing that's fun Definitely. for me and that is really nice to, you know, be a CEO of and a founder of and work with great people. And, and, and to be, to have a sexy company in the ecosystem is no longer as attractive. So you, you turn inward to a degree and you become someone who can just uh, 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 run their own thing by their own terms, a true sense of an entrepreneur, which is kind of an independent uh, person. So it's, it's this, the, the, you know, there are people that I suspect would feel meaningfully empowered by that. The, the funny thing on here is that what, what Sarah's doing and, uh, and I'll touch on like with us, we, we definitely are going um, to profitability as well. Um, and, um, I think, I think most other people in the, the ecosystem definitely are, uh, but 
what I think is going to happen is that there's going to be, so that there's going to be a lot of companies that got overcapitalized. There's going to be a lot of founders that it may, may have been like their, their first time around and they've just like, are just like heads in the sand, like not listening to advice as far as slow down spending. And a lot of them are just going to go out of business. And I think the ones that do survive, they be, they have the optionality to become profitable. I think that it's going to be kind of funny because those are going to be the, uh, as soon as the market turns, as far as the venture, uh, the people start investing in B's and C's and D's and all that. Those are the ones that actually are going to get the most attention um, to then go and win the market. So I think it's kind of, it's, it's really interesting that like we don't, we, we go towards profitability to not need VCs, but I think that that actually is going to attract more VCs in the end. If you are, if you can like through this like tech recession, call it, um, if you're able to survive and like be more or less like the market leader or, or, or whatever and become profitable and don't need capital when the, the market turns and people are investing, those are exactly the types of companies that people want to invest in because it's now... I think we lost Julian. Um, it's now, um, uh, it, it's clear that you have like a head start and everybody else. And then you could use a profitable foundation to then just like layer on, maybe it's more products or, or grow faster or anything like, like all, all of those other things. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's kind of funny. It's like the empowerment piece, but I guarantee you, Sarah, when, when we talk in like another like year or something, it's like, well, we both took on a, a bunch more venture. <laughs> And we're, we oh, may God. both be unprofitable again, but, but I think what, what not. It, well, but I think what, I think that what, what we, we, we both would have, we still will have is like the, the backdrop of becoming profitable. It's like, now we have a steady product and like, if we had to lay off some people, which would be terrible, obviously, but we still have an actual real product that like is at, at its core profitable. And um, we could go back to that if we need to, where like traditionally in some of the, the eras that Julian was talking about, it was just about growth at all costs. And like, you didn't have that foundation of profitability. You didn't, you didn't even think about that. It was all just around growth at all costs and all that. And you didn't have that backdrop to, to sit on. Like you didn't have that emergency break to be like, yeah, if things go, if we can't raise, raise any more money, we could still have a really good business that's going to be growing maybe 50% a year or whatever, um, and we'll, we'll be profitable. And I think that that's the foundation that we'll have. Um, so yep. I think it'll be interesting. Um, I, I, I hope Julian comes back on here, but I wanted to get, um, so to, just to, to, to change topics slightly, um, I, um, I, I want to get your take on this, Sarah, um, because you, you've been at, at, at Winnie for, for so long. Uh, so there's a tweet by Gogol, uh, Gokul. Um, uh, so he's, um, uh, uh, pre Google, pre square. He's now at yeah. DoorDash running. I don't know what he's running, but he's also, uh, he's an investor in my company. Um, he, he had a, he had a tweet that was, that was really interesting. Um, and the tweet reads, seen founder CEOs, uh, with zero forward vest, vested, vesting equity, long after their founder equity has fully vested. And he's basically, his long tweet here, but basically he's like, that's that's not totally fair to not re-up the actual founder CEO after they fully vested. Um, and then there's this kind of this big debate, uh, Keith Raboy is yeah. like, I you see this, okay. So he's like, I completely yeah, I disagree. That... Jeff Bezos never received a subsequent <laughs> grant. And then there's like two sides of the aisle. Um, for for one, so for one, I want to ask you about this, but I'll also I'll give my two cents on this. But I guess try to keep like your personal view out of it, and like, what do you think is actually best for the company to like reward the CEO with like more grants, or do you think like they've they've vested and like that's all the the vesting they're going to get? Maybe they get a salary increase or something like that. But based on like a venture back startup, so I think there's a a couple things at play. I mean, as a CEO, you are so invested in your company. Yes. First, from an equity perspective, but also, you know, you've just uh, devoted your time and energy to this thing instead of doing other things with your time and energy. You put all your chips in this one basket. So 
Uh, I think you have, like to, to Keith's point, you have so much incentive to continue making this thing valuable, whether you own 15% or 20% of the company. Yeah. It's a, you, you have a lot invested when you add up, you know, the fact that you've put your time and energy and name and livelihood and reputation yeah. and yeah. all this equity. So I don't necessarily think you need to get re-upped specifically with equity. I do think um, as, as. Oh, hi, uh, Jillian. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> um, we are talking about whether. Um, fully vested founders uh, still have motivation to build big businesses. And I think, yes, yeah, we, because, we talked, Julian, we talked about this in the WhatsApp <laughs> um, group. They have yeah. so much invested in the company, but at the same time, um, as, you know, a board and as investors in the business, if you still think the founders are the right people to take the business to the next level, you should be thinking about how to keep them motivated yeah. to continue working on the business. And if that motivation for the founders is coming as more equity, then and you and you think those founders are your best shot at making this investment worth something, you should mm. you should give them more equity. If if for the founders it's liquidity, then yeah. you should see how to how to get them some liquidity. If it's a higher salary, if it's being able to uh build a, a feature or element of the business that they're super passionate about. Right. Um, you know, for Winnie, like we have a huge impact angle to our business and we found impact investors who believe in that. Yeah. Um, I think that the big thing that keeps me and the team motivated is feeling like we are benefiting people and doing good in the world. And so if that element of the business was taken from us, that would be worth to me more than, than equity. Like I care right. a lot about, uh, helping both parents and providers, um, especially those who are low income. So um, I think it's it's more about what motivates those founders. And if those are still the right founders to take the business to the next level, if they're not, and you feel like you could hire an outside CEO that's better, um, then by all means, go use the money or equity to do that. But if, if you want to yeah. retain the existing team you better figure out what will keep them motivated. Yeah, and I think, so for one, I think Keith Roy's um, like counter example of uh, one of the, the, the most successful companies ever CEO didn't get a subsequent grant is totally not fair, obviously. Um, they had an amazing business and they IPO'd very early on in their, in their tenure. Um, and uh, he uh, was liquid very early. I think that, I would definitely advise um, CEO founders once you do um, like hit you, you, you're fully vested um, to go and especially if you're if you're hitting your goals and everything to go to the board and be like like I want a refresh grant like I I would advise that I think that's also the, in the best interest of the company as well like to your point Sarah like well to to your point, like if, if the the CEO um, and if, if they were the founder, if they're not the right person, they should not even be in the CEO role. I think I think that you should not, you should look for somebody else, and then you should uh, give them uh, the options and uh, the salary that a new CEO would get. But I think Gokul's point was that like once you're fully vested, like like if if you need to continue to, oh, Julian's gone, gone again. Um, you need to continue to, uh, it, it's not, it's not even like make it worth things, but I think a lot of things have changed since like the days of Amazon. Like I, I remember reading the S1 of Ox and we had Aaron Levy. He owned, I think it was less than 3% of the company. And like, I think he's like a really unique person who saw, who was just like so bought into the vision and, he was like, I can make this company. I can't remember what they what their market cap was when they're IPO, but definitely was not a lot. And he's taken that company. He's made it worth a lot, a lot more. But I don't think I, I think in like this day and age, as far as opportunity cost um, for a lot of founders that are executing um, like it's and also it's just kind of a nice thing to have the board on your side to be like, look, we want to give this to you because you have been really executing on this. It's a nice way to be to to kind of keep all the incentives aligned and everything like that. And then the, the counter argument is like, yeah, you could use it for other employees and all of that. And and of course you can, 
you, but also you can always create a new option pool and dilute existing investors and give other people um, more equity um, as far as new hires and everything like that. But I think that it's a nice thing. If I was on a board and I saw that my, like what, like for you, Sarah, if I, if I, if I was on your board and I'm like, you guys have been, been killing it for this long and you, you've been at it for, for over seven years now. And you, you're, I'm, I'm assuming you had like a, a four year grant and you're fully vested. I'd be like, we got to re up on the options here. Like Sarah's turn. This thing now is profitable. Like we, at least to, to show our support as far as the execution that you've been able to do. That's what I would definitely like Damn, push towards. Do you want to join my board? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not taking board seats, but, um, <laughs> that that's that's what i would think like i'm trying to take myself out of the position like of course my personally i would like to hit more and i definitely would ask if i think that i've been executing but i think that it is in the best interest of the entire company to like to reward everybody and like the ceo um if you if you were going to replace them with somebody else and you're going to give them whatever five percent of the company like i don't understand why that wouldn't go to a fully vested founder if they're executing at uh, the same or higher level than you would have to if, if you brought in another CEO that you give them. It just doesn't make any sense. To me. So I'm, I'm the, on the Google thing, side, but I'm yeah, also not an investor. So we talked about this in the WhatsApp. I told you about my experience doing this. I owned a bunch of the business. I invested. There was a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Breather, my previous business. And, uh, and we were going through the process and I think I think we were all aligned by the time that we went and hired a CEO that that was the right move, you know. But I I will say that probably when I asked for the grant, this is all why there were there were lots of reasons we went out and hired a CEO, and uh, but I'm sure that in the minds of the board they were like we can give this guy five percent or whatever the number was, you know, that, that I theoretically asked for in my crazy mind where I thought I had the met when the megalomaniac version of myself appeared, which is it happens on occasion. The uh <laughs> that they were like, we could give it to him or we could give it to this other guy. And they there was no guy in the wings, right? But Or gal. Well, guy or gal in the wing, it's always a guy from eBay. You know what I mean? It's like, it's always a guy from eBay for some reason. And so the, the result is, is they thought, okay, well, you know, if this is market, then let's figure out yeah. who's in market. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, and I owned a lot of the business. I want to be, I want to emphasize, but I, I felt a little bit this way. Uh, and, and I think it, it turned out, uh, it, it was a, a negotiation, a negotiation I was happy with without going into details, but like I you gotta respect these guys like Aaron Levy, who just ultimately, from a percentage standpoint, who get over and I tell coaching clients, get over get over the percentage. Like, look at what the amount is that it is worth. And it'd be like Aaron Levy just looked at it, he said, I'm into this. So I probably loves being a CEO the way that I do, probably you all do. Yeah. And was like, was like, it's still twenty million or whatever the hell, fifty million or some number at the time. And that's fine. Yeah, I, I think it's fine. But also, I think that like showing support from the board for like the execution of the CEO, like especially given let's let's just take Aaron's example, like for him to be able to take that company public and like I, I like and and I think there's a lot of things you could do. So like as a founder CEO, you definitely should be pushing your board to, to you should be asking for it, obviously. Um and like, I think it's totally fair to, to create some sort of targets and metrics. Like this is what Elon did with, uh, that's, that's how he made all of his money off of Tesla, right? He's like, if I get the stock price up to this point, like I'm going to get this additional grant and everything, thing like that. I think it just aligns everybody's incentives to do everything. And, and you can say like to, from Keith or Boy's point, it's like, well, Jeff Bezos didn't, didn't need any more like motivation to do that. He had that internally, but I think that's like a nice thing to do to just show your support from the board. Um, but also from you as the CEO, you should, of course, you should be asking for it. Um, and whether that is from salary and also like going back, like I'm sure all of us here, um, like took like super tiny. I know for my last company at ship, like took super tiny salaries. I was like, 
sharing like a four bedroom flat in San Francisco. Like, I think it's like, it's your duty as the board to make sure that the, the, like the founder and executive team or whoever, they don't have to worry about like the small things. So I think cash obviously is like, mm -hmm. I, I remember a world where it was like, like CEOs and, and founders need to, to, it's a ramen diet, all that. I think that's kind of changed, which I'm glad about, like, especially in the world of like people having like families and like, I also like if, if I was, uh, I, I'm a big, obviously, um, building in an SF type of person. So I would want to like, uh, compensate the, um, the, the CEO or, or whoever else, um, to make sure they could live there because I think the chances to make a bigger company, to make a big company or hire for you to live there. A lot of people don't actually subscribe to that. And they think that you have equity in the company. You're going to get rewarded at the end. And like, you should be able to take a lower salary. And like a lot of the times the CEO is actually not the highest paid, which I don't necessarily think that the CEO should be paid the highest. I, I think normally like, especially in like a my business, like sales probably is the the one that they generate most of the revenue. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine not being the highest paid, but I think that you, the board needs to look out for the best interest of the company, which doesn't always align with you as an investor kind of right. Like giving the CEO a, a more of a grant is obviously going to dilute them. And even if it's like a tiny bit, like th that tiny bit matters sometimes to them. I, I think psychologically, it doesn't matter in the yeah. returns. Um, but like, mm -hmm. it's just like, why would I need to do this? But like, it just shows that you're, you're supportive. And like, if you like that, that person that found that founder CEO, they can go and, and like, they're still going to get the same equity if they left. And so it's like, maybe it's that, that one thing to keep them, um, like excited, especially like if you get down to like the two to 3%, like I can definitely tell you from my, my experience, like if I own two or 3% of a company, um, like my opportunity cost is extremely high to go start something, another company. Like yeah. I, I, I think, I think that there's that probably is... like a, a minimum amount that you want to make sure your founders stay above. I would argue though, that like for, for keeping those founders around, if, if that's who you want to continue to run the company, yes, like the cash comp is more meaningful in the short term because that's where they might make a decision to, to do something that's short-sighted to get some liquidity um, right. even though they know like the business could be much bigger they don't want to to have that time horizon they want the money now so they're gonna of sell course. sooner so i feel like if you want that bigger outcome in the end which i think investors do um you want to you know keep the founders uh motivated and, yeah. and having enough cash like you said not just to live and not eat ramen all the time um but, but focus, to focus on the business focus that's, on the business yeah. and be happy yeah. with their lifestyle that they don't want to make a short-sighted uh right. kind of change just for some more I, liquidity I, you're totally i totally agree sarah and there's also something you know in the garden just to my personal experience i, I owned a lot of the business i said give me another grant it, it, I, I think it's fine to say this the board was like no <laughs> a lot of the business, you know. You need to get me in your, and, on your on your board. You know, I'll I'll fight for I, you, Julian. I the uh they but but there's the board has to maintain goodwill. Yeah, and and that is so so. I have a lot mm -hmm. of very good negotiators on my board. I think of myself as a medium term negotiator, but like maintaining goodwill of the CEO while doing this. There's a, a great, I've been rereading uh, Amp It Up, Frank Slootman's book. Oh, we're not going to find uh, out. Oh, I know. Goodwill. I know. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. His thing about <laughs> retaining authority in the face of the board, especially as a hired CEO, is super interesting because, especially as a hired CEO, if oh, you've never done Julian, it Julian, we're losing you. No. Um, yeah. Let's yeah. let, what, why don't we move on to so so we we have a few minutes left. What why don't we move on to do, do you guys have any other topics that you want want to talk about? Like we we haven't been on here um uh, in a while. Um I definitely like can, can think of one. Kevin, give it to us. Okay. So, what do you what do you guys feel like the the, the so we all have probably pretty good 
founder networks and investor networks right now. What do you guys kind of feel like the the pulse on the entire like industry? And let's let's talk about venture right now. I know Sarah may not return to the venture markets ever again and be totally profitable and then go IPO. Um, but like, what is your pulse right now on like our our companies, uh, your your friends' companies going to business? Are like is growth slowing? Like, what is your what is your kind of like feeling in the in the the, the total markets right now? Sarah, go ahead. It doesn't seem great. Like I, I am seeing stuff on like Twitter, or I guess we call it X now, about oh, the best companies are still getting funded, um, but those aren't any companies that I know about in my network. I agree. <laughs> I agree. So I am not seeing it now. Granted, you know some of the the companies I have the most insight into are in like the childcare and education space, which right. are probably not getting a lot of the funding. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I I am not seeing the best companies still get funded. I'm seeing a lot of folks shift into profitability or at least like or AI. extending their, their runway. And even with AI, I mean, I am seeing so many AI founders looking for a use case. Like I get emails from different AI founders and companies like asking for insight into, yeah. you know, basically what they can build. Um, so I'm also not convinced that there's like a lasting, uh, huge opportunity. If, if I were to even shift my company to have some kind of AI focus, I don't know that there's tons of money out there for that either, because I think, you know, maybe there was there were some companies that got a lot of funding um, and initial excitement for AI, but I'm not convinced that those investors are going to continue making those bets for years and years. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that people are definitely, so we're, the latest hype cycle is AI. Uh, the previous hype, uh, hype cycle was crypto. Um, like we all go through these hype cycles. And I think that now people are definitely sharpening their pencils on these AI companies that, and, and a lot of the thesis is that, that a lot of the um, innovation is going to go towards uh, a lot of the larger companies that already have a lot of the data. And so like the bolt on AI companies, like how much value do you actually have there? Um, but I would right. definitely agree with um, the sentiment that Sarah has. Like the like I've seen like decks from Carta and like people on Twitter as far as like yeah no there's still like A and B deals getting done. I don't see it. Um, and also like um, so we we are um, we're a Series A company um, uh, looking to to so the first part of the year we were looking to raise our Series B, which was the, the absolute worst fucking time ever. Um, and we couldn't get it done at, at terms that we wanted to. I think I, I, th I think I talked to like 120 investors or something like that. And well, it was just like, it's, and, and we have, I, I've never been in this position before. I've always been like on the opposite. So like my last company ship, like we were all hype and no, like we didn't have any like true, like we were gross margin negative. Um, we were just burning money like crazy. Um, and now it's like the opposite and like, I can't get anybody to like write a meaningful check. Um, and so like, we're doing the same thing that Sarah, that you're doing. Um, and we have raised money, um, to kind of get us through kind of, I, I hope it's crossing the chasm until where the market kind of rebounds, but like, it's, it's kind of crazy to, to see where, where we are as a business and people are not able to come around to us and also like we're not in a sexy industry either uh which i kind of like um but i'm also hearing the same things um from other uh founders uh either they've gone out of business they're going out of business uh they can't raise any more capital it's kind of like it's really tough out there seed still seems to be the area that people that hasn't really changed because that's always the the unknown, I know Julian speaks a lot about this, but it's like, uh, like don't show like it's, it, 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 and I, I can't remember what your saying is, but like when you're, when you're a seed company, it's basically like, like 
it's all about the story and like don't have any metrics and all that. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Julian. Um, but like I'm, that's I'm gonna emphasize it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that th- those yeah. are the companies getting funded. And even I, I'm seeing a lot of like later stage funds coming to the seed market because they're just like they're unsure of like if we do this A, is there going to be somebody to do this B? Or if we do this B, is there going to be somebody to do this C? And I think that's the worry that all of these investors are like really worried about. Um, I, I I hope the tides are changing. I think that um, hopefully this fall, when, when everybody comes back from Italy, apparently that's where all the VCs were this summer, <laughs> um, that it'll change and it, 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 it will help. I think that um, and also a lot of B2B startups are struggling because um, a lot of the, the CFOs have um, really started to cut back on a lot of the, the excess tools that they really didn't need. And so a lot of the B2B startups that were growing at 150, 200% are now growing at like 50 or 75% because people are just right. like, they're not renewing and all of those things. And so like, as an industry, like, um, for my case, so we don't sell to other software companies and Sarah, you're the same, uh, Julian, I would say more or less, you're the same as well, but there is a really big, like holdback for B2B companies. And you see this in the public markets as well, but I don't know, that's kind of my, my two cents in the market right now. I hope it, it, it turns and it, it definitely will. It, everything is cyclical. Um, it, it, this yeah. is going to turn around. There's going to be um, more VC funding, uh, in the future. It's just kind of like, how do you get your company, um, to survive and then hopefully build a really good like foundation to then be able to take on more capital as well. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And so I, I'm seeing deals getting done. I, I have coaching clients who have deals getting done, but they are flying companies like wild, very much working. And then I'm deal, I'm seeing deals struggle. I'm not in market. What's a fly? What's a what's a flying company for people that are listening? Uh, like not an actual, want, not the actual want, name, yeah. but like growth metrics. Yeah, I, yeah I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to anonymize that. Uh, amazing markets. Yeah, yeah. It's just like everything. Everything is going the right direction. Every everything, everything is going in the right direction, and then people are th- continue to throw cash, but things have to be just are, right. Are, and for everybody else, are you talking not so to- much? Are you talking 200, 300% growth and like they're profitable or like what types of companies are getting funded? They're in the AI space or like uh, what's happening? Yeah. So a lot of my great investors that have more cash to deploy plus growing to 300% plus lots of people that want to add money. It's like... Everyone believes in the business, but it's, but again, it's an exception. It's an exception. So everybody else is struggling for sure. Right. Right. Well, why don't we end it on that note? Hopefully all the, as all the investors get back from their nice Italy vacations, um, they'll start, uh, writing some term sheets, uh, because it affects all of us. Like the, the C rounds getting done and, in fact, the B rounds, which impact the A rounds, which the seed is relatively untouched, but like we're a whole ecosystem building off each other. So hopefully we'll get back to that. Um, it seems like inflation is going down, which hopefully means eventually that the interest rates will go down, which means there'll be more funding, um, for venture back startups. Um, so hopefully we've, we've kind of crossed the, 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 the worst part of everything. And, um, but if you're listening to this and you're a founder, do what Sarah did, get profitable, don't have to rely on any other funding. Um, and unless you guys want to add anything else, we could wrap up on that. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Thanks for listening, Sarah, everybody. Nice Thanks for joining, Sarah. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.